Hi, everybody. Welcome to Live Wire Reviews podcast. This is season one, episode four, and we're going to go a little bit off topic today. Today, we're going to be talking about some technologies that are just outside of the EV range. But first, I'm going to start off with electric vehicle news this week. And if you're listening to this on Spotify, come over to our YouTube channel. It's at youtube.com slash at Live Wire Review. There is a video version of this podcast there. We also do reviews, interviews, and tech tips. So to start off the news today, we're talking about the Ionic 5N once again. Now, Hyundai holds this special festival called the Hyundai N Festival, and they're gonna be adding a racing circuit that includes the Ionic 5N in a circuit called the EN1 series. So that's pretty cool that they're gonna be showcasing some of the race technology that they're putting out on their electric vehicles. And what's really nice about that is it gives them a nice testing ground to be able to test these high performance parts and see how the car holds up in a racing scenario. And another Ionic 5 news, they're actually up, sales are up 100% in the US for the first quarter this year. So they've actually doubled their sales of Hyundai vehicles in the EV sector. And that's always good news. This next one is just a little bit of speculation when it comes to what GM is doing. Uh, Mary Barra had actually said that they're going to be developing plug-in hybrids soon, and they're going to be using some of the existing technology in the market. Now, if you read through the news articles, they're just speculating on what some of the vehicles are on the market. So there's a good indication that the Equinox plug-in hybrid will likely be the first one to come out. Um, The Chevy Equinox has been a very popular vehicle, and they already have a version of a plug-in hybrid over in China. Now, this one is actually a Buick. It's not a Chevy Equinox, but it's based on the same uh, idea. It runs a 1.5 liter four-cylinder engine. The U.S. and North American market is likely to see a 1.5 turbo paired with uh, a very unknown size of battery. Over in China, it's about a nine and a half kilowatt, but here in North America, that's not quite gonna cut it. As we know, the Chevy Volt used to come with an 18 kilowatt hour battery, so I would like to see something in that range for this vehicle. I'm really looking forward to that, so let's keep an eye on that. So next piece of news is the Salton Sea in Southern California. There's a lot of companies out there that are looking to do something called direct lithium extraction using a filter in order to get lithium brine out from the bottom of this lake. Now that's really good news for the industry. It means that we'll have more supply of lithium for batteries for electric vehicles and other purposes. And what's nice is there's no evaporation of the lake needed to get it and there's no strip mining required. It's a lithium brine lake with a lot of different, a lot of deposits of lithium that are available. And uh, people like Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and others are looking into this direct lithium extraction. And I'm really looking forward to that technology. I hope it has a little bit less environmental impact and gets us the lithium we require to move forward with an all electric future. Now on this channel, everybody wants to know about the longevity of EVs. So one example that I found this week is a Tesla Model S P90 rear wheel drive that has covered 2 million kilometers. Uh, I believe there's a couple of interviews out there on YouTube, so go and check it out. And if you want to know more information about this, Uh, this guy travels something like 120,000 plus kilometers per year, and they've been through 13 motors in 2 million kilometers and four battery packs, which makes perfect sense, about 500,000 kilometers per battery pack. Uh, Judging by the math that I've done in the past, that makes perfect sense. Now, as for the motors, you're probably asking, why did it go through 13 motors? It may not be common knowledge, but in the EV industry, it is common knowledge that the rear drive unit on a Model S or a Model X uh, was cooled with coolant And the problem is there are certain seals inside that motor that would actually leak over time, which would allow coolant to go into where the bearings were and then wipe them out. So that's why these drive units had to be changed so often. There are aftermarket companies now that are coming out with something called a coolant delete. So you can actually run this motor without the coolant running through this area and there's no danger of coolant running into those bearings. So all you have to do is take your unit, take it out and they will replace the bearings that are required and they'll put on this coolant delete kit and then you'll be able to drive your Tesla Model S for many more kilometers to come. 
So there is some evidence on the internet that battery replacement costs are coming down. We'll use the Tesla Model Y for an example with a 75 kilowatt hour pack. I've heard in the past that it was about $20,000 Canadian plus $4,000. So about a cost of $24,000 to replace your battery pack in your Tesla. Now, a couple of bills are going around the internet, anecdotal evidence, of course, but it shows that in a Tesla Model Y, it's about $9,000 US to get your battery pack replaced with a remanufactured unit. And in Canada, there is a, another um, bill of sale going around that shows $11,000 Canadian to change a battery pack in a Model Y. So that's two pieces of evidence we've seen that shows that remanufactured batteries are definitely coming down in price. Now keep in mind, this would be made up of battery packs that were taken under, under warranty. Let's say one of them had a bad cell. Now there's four modules across these packs. So that means you have three good modules that could still be used. So then they would get another pack, another three modules that are still good. And then they would make one good module out of that. And then when they have enough modules from other battery packs that come in, they make a good pack out of that. So that would be your remanufactured battery pack. So if your pack has gone bad, it means that you can replace it for a much lower cost nowadays. And it makes the cost of ownership of EVs even less than it was before. And more battery repair centers are starting to pop up all over the place. So battery repair costs are actually going to come down quite a bit. There is more competition. There's more places you can take your car to get the battery repaired in the future. In Europe, a place called Man Battery Repair is starting to pop up. It's called MAN Battery Repair. And here in North America, as we know, we have Greenwood Materials that is recycling packs and allowing all the raw materials to go back into production of new batteries. And right now we're looking at about 92% recovery of battery materials in recycling. So it's really good news for the EV industry. Despite some of the misinformation out there, 92% of a battery pack is replaced after it's gone through all the channels of use before its end of life. Only two pieces of news here when it comes to chargers. Uh, one, the Brockville, Ontario supercharger has started construction. I don't know when it will be finished, but it's nice to see more supercharger stations opening up. And another piece of news from Flow, they're trying out this idea. Um, they're releasing a charger that brews coffee using wireless induction technology from their power modules. So it's a couple of fast chargers tied together and in the middle of it, they actually have a setup that will brew coffee on site. Even if stores are closed and everything around, it'll be the, just this unit built right into the flow station. Now I gotta say, I love that because when I'm on a road trip and I'm charging, there's only two things I really need to do. One, I have to find a bathroom after two and a half hours of driving and uh, I need a coffee. I need a coffee just to keep going. So I am so thrilled to see that they wanna put coffee makers into the fast chargers. That is such cool technology and I love it. Well, last week we talked about a battery powered train and this week we're talking about hydrogen. As you know, I am a big fan of hydrogen when it comes to large vehicles, let's say planes, trains, and big trucks. It's a great technology to use in the future when it comes to moving large objects over large distances. Now, they're entering the test phase with these hydrogen trains and there's a company called Stadler, Stadler Flirt H2 and it travels 2,803 kilometers or 1,741 miles on over 46 hours of driving this train on one fuel supply. It was a three car passenger fuel cell train. Now, just to recap there, that's 2,800 kilometers, 1,700 miles, and it drove for 46 hours. That's a big difference from the battery powered train that we talked about last week. That means that hydrogen trains really are a viable option in the future, especially since trains today are already just a diesel engine pushing an electric power plant in order to move the locomotive. So it's going to be very easy to convert those locomotives to a hydrogen fuel cell setup as long as they come up with a container that can store the right amount of hydrogen for that journey. So moving forward, I expect to see a lot of hydrogen fuel cell trains before you see hydrogen fuel cells in cars because the infrastructure for cars is a lot more difficult whereas for the train they'll be able to build the infrastructure right next to the track at the station. Uh, here in Canada there's actually some job postings up for the Volkswagen battery plant in St. Thomas near London, Ontario. So if you're in this area and you're looking for a job I would uh, go ahead and check that out. It's always good to see that they're creating jobs in the EV sector. Uh, another piece of news, 
31 countries have actually gone over the tipping point of 5% when it comes to battery electric vehicle sales. Uh, we're a little further down on the list. If you look at the US, you're at about 8.6%, which is still over the 5% tipping point. And Canada is anywhere from 8.6 to 10.5%, depending on what uh, data set you use. Uh, the growth was largely driven by three models, the Tesla Model 3, the Ford Mustang Mach-E, and the Ford F-150 Lightning. And this is stated by S&P Global, which is actually where some of the data came from for this study. Um, another study showed that mass adoption is likely at 16%, so we're not quite at the mass adoption level, but we are over the tipping point, so it means the EVs are going to continue on into the future. There's a new dirt bike out. Well, it's not actually out yet. I believe 2025 is when it's going to be released, and I'm always excited to see electric dirt bikes. When you think electric dirt bikes, you probably think of Suron or Segway or companies like that. Now, I kind of miss one old company, I can't remember the name of it, but they built a proper dirt bike. It wasn't like uh, a downhill mountain bike with dirt bike tires on it. This was an actual dirt bike frame that was built by a great company, but I believe it went under in 2018. If I can find it, I'm just gonna put the name of it up on the screen here. It might have been Atlas or something like that. Um, but nowadays, we're actually starting to look at full-size dirt bike frames. And uh, another one that's gonna be coming to the market is called the Electric Honda CR. Now this is benchmarked on the CRF 250R. That's actually the frame they use for it. And they're using it in racing right now. I believe this was um, announced back in 2019, but they're actually using it in racing now to test the prototype before it comes to market. And according to some cues, it should be out by 2025. Uh, they found with motocross use in dirt bikes, the range is not as important because you're not going over long distances, you're doing races and you can charge up in between those races. Uh, they are really good at winning hole shots because of that instant torque. So they usually take off out front right away. They're coming up with 10 new models, electrified models. Uh, four of them will be coming to the US market. Two EVs have actually earned top safety pick plus awards for their safety when it comes to crash testing. And that is the 2024 Tesla Model Y and also the Rivian R1T. So if you're looking for a really safe vehicle for your family, the Model Y and the R1T are perfect choices for you. So that's it for the news. We're actually gonna be talking about other technologies that are not electric vehicle related, but they share some cues with it. So I wanted to bring this, uh, bring this topic up. Think about some of the ways your home is heated, where your hot water is heated, and uh, different ways you power things in your life. We are very much reliant on fossil fuels for heating our homes. And it's always puzzled me why we're so reliant on those fossil fuels when there are other technologies that are available. Uh, I believe propane, natural gas, and gasoline should be used as backup sources of energy rather than our main source. So for example, you know, there are vehicles out there that have to get across distances going up way north where there are no charging stations. So an electric vehicle does not fit the bill there. The Ram Charger does take care of a lot of these problems because of that series hybrid setup. So you get the electric range out of it when you can use it, but you also have a gasoline powered engine to get you where you need to go in a pinch or, you know, let's say for emergency vehicles, an ambulance or a fire truck or something like that would be a perfect setup for a series hybrid or a series plug-in hybrid setup, just like the Ram Charger. This is why I'm so enamored with this vehicle. And I swear I've brought this up in four different uh, videos or podcasts now because I am so happy with this technology. Think about an ambulance that had the Ram Charger uh, drivetrain in it. So they could go on their calls, do 90% of what they need to do. But if they're stuck in an accident scene for let's say 18 hours straight, and you know they have to idle the whole time, this would be the perfect setup for that plug-in hybrid that is in the Ram Charger. You, uh, the, the engine would just fire up when it's required, when that battery is uh, almost depleted, and it would recharge it. And then when the battery has a sufficient charge level, the engine would turn off. So this is one of those situations where you still use your fossil fuels as your backup fuel source, but your electric is still your primary fuel source. It would lower so many emissions, and it just really does fix that problem. So this next part is about heat pumps. As you know, heat pumps are one of my favorite things in an EV. 
my first EV that I bought was a 2019 Hyundai Kona Electric, and I specifically picked that one over the Tesla because of the heat, pack, heat pump technology that was in it. Tesla was still using a PTC heater back in 2019, whereas the Hyundai Kona Electric was actually taking their heat from the atmosphere, from the battery, from the motor, from the inverter, from the charger, anything that it could pull heat from, it was pulling, pulling heat using that heat pump system. It uses a bunch of different switching valves. It goes in two different directions, you know, for your heating and your cooling. And that way it can shuffle the heat around where it needs to be. Now, Tesla took this heat pump technology and they went one step further. They compacted the system. They added a few different modes of operation and uh, they made something called the Octo Valve, which is an eight way valve. And it's just one giant manifold that directs where the Freon needs to go. And with this eight-way valve, they actually have about 12 to 15 different operating modes for different situations. And one of the most creative operating modes they have is they, when you park your car, let's say Walmart to go in and get groceries, and when you turn the car off and get out, it actually turns on the air conditioner in order to scavenge the heat in the cabin and store it in the coolant surrounding the battery. So take this technology and we're gonna apply it to something else. I'll start this off with a story about when we moved into the, our current home. It was back in 2018 and we borrowed a little bit of extra money so that we could take care of one problem with the house. It had a 27 year old air source heat pump from the 1990s as its main source of heat. And it also used a 15,000 watt electric heater for when that air source heat pump was not able to heat the home. Now, this was technology back from the 1990s, and it was the best technology available at the time. This air source heat pump could cool, or sorry, cool the house, and it could also warm the house down to minus eight Celsius. So that means anything below minus eight, that heat pump system turned off, and that 15,000 watt electric heater would turn on, basically a giant hair dryer uh, warming up the house. So it used a ton of power. And not only that, like I said, it was 27 years old and it had recently been repaired before we moved in. So this furnace had to go. This is when we were contemplating, what do we do? Uh, the street that we live on has natural gas running as a service down the road. Do we hook up to this natural gas? Because this house has never been hooked up to it. Or do we look at other technologies out there? And then one day I thought, why don't I look into geothermal heat, which is something called a ground source heat pump. So we priced out what it would cost to hook up to the natural gas, put in a uh, natural gas furnace, and also because it's just a furnace, we would also have to buy an air conditioner. So a uh, furnace, air conditioner, and hook up to natural gas was gonna cost us about $24,000 Canadian, and then we'd be stuck with the monthly bill where you have your service fees for delivery of the natural gas, which is gonna be on every single bill, even if you don't use any gas, and then the cost of the natural gas on top of that. Now, we were also starting to think back then that we did not want to add to our carbon footprint. We were looking at ways that we could lower it. So this started the search for the geothermal heat pump. Now, here in Midland, we actually got Fred Hook to come and install a geothermal ground source heat pump at our house. The quote for this job was about $28,500, so about $4,500 more than it would have cost to install a natural gas system. Now, this is not the case for everybody. A uh, geothermal ground source system has two different types. There is one type where there are loops of coolant that go in the ground and they are laid horizontally. They're about four to five feet below the surface of the ground, and they have to be about 400 feet long. For the size of our house, it was about 400 feet. It depends on the size of your home and how much heating and cooling you require for how long those loops are going to be. So if you have some property, you're able to lay them out lengthwise and it saves you a lot of money. Um, if you live in a very small property and you have to put those, uh, those lines straight down, you probably need about three loops 150 feet deep and you need a well drilling company to come and put those loops in so that that raises the cost dramatically so on a small property a geothermal ground source heat pump will cost let's say about sixty thousand dollars canadian instead of twenty eight thousand five hundred or thirty thousand dollars now there are other options out there for ground source heat pumps 
you can actually use them in a community. There are actually a lot of communities out there right now as test communities that are, have shared geothermal lines. I'm gonna put one graphic on the screen now that I found that was actually kind of interesting. It actually showed the, uh, the heat pump system was in a building that is not at the house. So like there would be like a power plant type building. It's not actually a power plant, but the building would have the heat pumps inside of it and it would send the heated or cooled water out to each one of the businesses or buildings or homes in that community. So that's one approach you could do with it. The other one is everybody would have their own furnace, but they would all just share the loops that are in the ground. So you put one set of central loops that go through the community and then everyone in that community shares from those lines. There's actually a, um, a community in Markham, Ontario, that they're gonna be warming and cooling 300 homes using shared geothermal ground source heat pump lines. And then each house is gonna have their own furnace that just taps into those lines. So it's really neat technology, and I'm glad to see that we're starting to move towards this in the future, but most of the contractors that build houses nowadays, they don't touch this. One of my biggest pet peeves is that I drive by new construction in the country and I see a house that's freshly built and there's a big fat green propane tank sitting next to the house. This is one of those situations where you could very easily put in a ground source heat pump or a geothermal heat pump system because you already have the excavator there digging the basement. It would be no extra cost whatsoever to have that excavator dig what's required to put in some ground source heat pump lines. And to add on to that, you could also design this house to be net zero. And net zero homes, they face, they face south here in order to face the sun. And they're built in such a way that they use almost no energy. They use about 10% of the energy of a normal home. So they become net zero when you add things like solar panels on it so you can feed back to the grid. And then you effectively have no cost for running your home. So net zero homes paired with geothermal that is already dug when the home is being built. It's just like the perfect pair. Now I'm gonna lead into a couple more ideas I had with this ground source heat pump and maybe a little better explanation of how it works. So here at our house, we chose to use a water furnace. Now this is a type of ground source heat pump in which the, um, the compressor for this system is inside the home and uh, there are coolant lines that go underground. So in my case, there's a pump on the system and it pumps antifreeze through the lines that go underground. And um, the underground temperature always stays right around six degrees Celsius. So when you bury these lines, you're always pulling from ground that is about six degrees. So in order to heat your home, basically what happens is an air conditioning compressor turns on and it cools that coolant down to about, let's say four degrees Celsius. Then it pumps it through those lines and then that six degree ground absorbs or transfers the heat to the, the glycol coolant until it's back up to six degrees again. And that's how you heat your home. Now, when you reverse this process to cool your home in the summer, it's even more efficient. Because if you think about it, you're taking 40 degree air and you're putting it into the ground that is always a constant six degrees. So then what you do is you raise the temperature of the water to say eight to 10 degrees Celsius, and then the ground cools it off until it's back to six degrees. So that's in a nutshell how a geothermal ground source system works. I just wanted to move on to a ways that we can improve it. So right now, we actually get 20 to 30% of our domestic hot water using that geothermal system. And that's because there are lines that are plugged into it and the water from the hot water tank is actually sent over to where the, uh, the compressor is. And it runs by something called the superheated manifold or the superheated portion of the compressor. So when that compressor is running, it actually transfers some of the waste heat during that process to the hot water tank. So that is very efficient, but I think there are still ways we can improve. So if we go back to the way the Tesla system works with that manifold, I was thinking that a house could actually have a system set up in which you would have a very um, sophisticated manifold system for a geothermal heat pump. You could run all of your hot water off of a geothermal heat pump system. Right now on the market, you can have an electric hot water tank, you can have a natural gas hot water tank, you can have a propane, and you can have one with an air source heat pump on it. 
Now the air source heat pump ones are actually pretty ingenious because then you're just drawing heat from whatever source of heat your HVAC system is. And um, I think we can improve upon this. Instead of using a heat pump system to draw from the air, why not just use the heat pump that's already built into the geothermal system? Now this would, like I said, require a manifold and maybe even different size TXB valves in order to get the heat required for that system. But with a sophisticated software driven manifold, you could actually run your domestic hot water tank off of a geothermal system. Of course, all of your HVAC needs would come off of that same system. And if you're really ingenious, you could even heat your pool. Going back to, remember what I said about that 40 degree air that you're pumping into six degree round? What if you used a manifold that directed that excess heat over to your swimming pool, let's say if you had that, or even your hot tub, or anything that you may require heat for in the house. In the summer, your, your house is hot and you want it to cool off, and your pool is cool and you want it to warm up. So this is just like the perfect pair. Now, of course, in between those systems, you could always heat your pool using the ground source just like everything else. You might need some longer loops, maybe a more robust compressor, but this system could totally work. And it could be a software driven system with something very similar to, similar to what the Tesla uses with that octo valve. And it could be designed for your house. And the nice thing is a manifold in your house could be set up very much like your electrical box or like a very complicated manifold system for your water. Uh, the technicians will be able to customize it for every situation. Now, part of the reason I am so interested in heat pumps like this is because of their efficiency. If you were to use an air source heat pump, which actually is what is heating and cooling the room that I'm in right now, uh, you get something called a COP, a coefficient of performance. Now that is measured as like, let's say a two to one or a four to one, which means that for one unit of energy that you put into it, you get four units of heat or cooling out of it. That's what a COP means. So here in the shop, um, you get about a four to one COP when it's warmer weather. Let's say anything over zero degrees, five degrees to 15 degrees, heating your shop or your house with an air source heat pump is actually quite efficient. But when you dip below zero degrees and get down to let's say minus 15, you're only getting about a two to one COP. So for every unit of energy that goes into it, you get two units of energy out of it. Now that's still a good system. It, feasibility wise, it's very, very easy to throw in an air source heat pump because all you need is uh, let's say a mini split or even a full HVAC system. It's just two parts and you can put it into any house anywhere. I even have seen them out East and they're very popular. Uh, when it comes to the geothermal system though, the efficiency is even higher because you're always drawing from ground that is a constant temperature all year round. The efficiency is incredibly good. You're looking about a four to five COP when it comes to a geothermal ground source heat pump system. And that's why I think it's such a good way to move forward into the future when it comes to new builds of houses or even pre-existing ones like our own. Now, moving forward with this geothermal heat pump system, there are so many ideas I've had when it comes to this, and I've actually seen them implemented in other countries out, uh, let's say in Europe, uh, where there are waste sources of heat. You don't just have to use a heat pump with the heat that is underground. You can also use it for where there is waste heat. So using a manifold system, you could switch from a ground loop over to in large scale operations, Let's say there was a data center that had computers in it constantly running or servers always running. They're using lots of power, they're putting out lots of heat. They actually have to air condition the building in order to get rid of that heat. So what if we were to use a manifold in order to direct lines over to that building and the, instead of the air conditioning sending that heat outside, it was to take that heat and store it somewhere else. Let's say it was used to heat up um, a nearby school or a large office building, or even a community. And of course that community would be able to draw from heat from the ground when um, it was not feasible to draw heat from that server room. And uh, it's just a great way of getting rid of excess heat. Now you could also use that manifold to cool the data center in other times when you did not need the heat from that data center for heating the homes. Let's say you needed to cool the data center. Instead, you just reverse it, 
turn the manifold in such a way that it directs heat back to the ground. So you don't have to release that heat in the air. It then warms up the ground as it does in any ground source heat pump system. Uh, another idea that was out there was actually using the excess heat from the sewers. So again, using a manifold, if there was not enough heat in the sewers, you'd be able to draw the heat just from the ground. But being it that a sewer is already underground, it is likely always at a constant temperature and there is always warmer water entering that system because it's flushed down from houses that are already heated. So there is lots of excess heat in a sewer that would be usable to heat up buildings nearby. Uh, another type of geothermal system out there is where you actually take the loops and you throw them directly into a body of water because as long as they're deep enough in the water, you're able to draw heat from it all year round and again, cooling as well. So using it in the sewers, I think that's a great idea. You're just using a resource of heat that's already there and it's a way of avoiding fossil fuels. So this brings up feasibility. I know I've talked about a lot of ideas here. Not all of them will work. You have to do what is feasible for you. If you can't afford or don't want to spend the money uh, like we did on this very expensive ground source heat pump system, uh, you can always start with different systems like air source heat pumps. And for example, you can put a heat pump system on your pool in order to heat it up instead of just using, let's say a natural gas heater. You could use a heat pump system. Now to supplement that, you could also use a wood fired pool heater, which is something that we're considering here is it can warm up your pool very quickly in the spring and the fall. And then the heat pump or a solar heating system would be able to maintain the temperature from that point forward. In fact, you could even use all three of these if you're wealthy enough that you wanted to implement that. Solar heating of pools is actually the cheapest way you can heat your pool. You can put a uh, solar cover on the pool to keep the heat in. Uh, you can use solar tiles that are put on your roof. They're black and they absorb heat from the sun and they do a good job of maintaining the temperature over the summer months. What they're not so good for is bringing the temperature of the pool up quickly in the spring and the fall. So if you tied that with a wood fired pool heater, you'd be able to start a fire and get that pool heated up within about a day using wood. So those are just some of the options you have out there. You can use ground source heat pumps, air source heat pumps, uh, wood fire when it comes to certain situations uh, as a supplement, of course. If you use that as your only source of heat, you're gonna go through a lot of wood and you're not gonna have very good carbon footprint. But when you pair that with an air source or a ground source heat pump, you have a really good system. Or if you just pair a wood fired pool heater with a solar heating system, I think you got a good setup right there. And moving forward, we can always use software driven systems in order to incorporate lots of clean technologies in the future. We always use fossil fuels as a backup. And if we do use them as a backup instead of our main source of heat or transportation, we're gonna have a lot of it for years to come. So you can always store it in such ways that you can use it later. For example, if you use microgrids on the uh, power system with solar panels attached to them, you have wind power. And think about it this way, microgrids don't always have to have, let's say lithium ion batteries or even lithium iron phosphate batteries. They could have something like a gravity lift in a lot of places, the battery is not a battery. What it is is a system that actually lifts a heavy weight way up in the air and then when you need power from it it lowers that weight so it takes up the volatility of those solar and wind systems they can lift the weight while they're running and then when they're not you just lower the weight to keep getting power out of the system that way you have a constant source of power available and you're not using um, precious materials from the earth it's just basically an elevator system hoisting weight in the air i think those kind of systems are really cool there are even systems that are um, a vacuum locked um, barrel kind of, and it has a spinning weight inside of it. And because it's vacuum sealed, that spinning weight can store energy. So it's just, there are so many ways to store energy moving forward. It's just what technologies can we incorporate and how can we use software in, to our advantage to make these systems work. That brings me on to another sector of um, our world in which we could electrify and you don't have to use gasoline all the time. 
uh, chainsaws, lawnmowers, uh, snowblowers in some cases are good ways you can use batteries instead of small two-stroke gas engines that have no filters on them. They pollute a lot. So I myself, I've switched over to a ga uh, sorry, an electric powered chainsaw and we have electric trimmers, we have electric pole saws, and we have an electric lawnmower. The only thing <clears throat> that has not been feasible so far is a snowblower. Our snowblower is so good, I'm not gonna give it up for any time soon, but it's just a very small amount of fuel that I'll be using. The problem I have with the snowblower <clears throat> that would replace this one is it uses four large batteries. Um, let's say it's from the, the, the Ego two-stage snowblower. I actually really like that snowblower and I think it works for a lot of people. The cost to replace their batteries is a little high though. It's about $500 Canadian per battery. So you're looking for four batteries, you're looking at about $2,000 to replace them and they're gonna last about 10 years. It's a pretty high cost for a tool that probably is not gonna reduce your carbon footprint all that much. Now that's just in my case, like I said, these electric snowblowers, they do work well. It's just these batteries for them are quite expensive. Uh, I hope we can rebuild them in the future, but for right now, I use so little fuel in my snowblower, it's just gonna stay that way for now. That, this is where the feasibility comes in. And I'd like to hear your comments on this kind of stuff because I was able to switch over a lot of my items to electric and they use the same battery across the board. So that means that I didn't have to buy a whole bunch of batteries. Basically, if you run two batteries, you have one on the charger, one in the tool, and you're good to go. Another section that you could pair a battery with is actually generators. Because if you think about how a generator works, it's incredibly wasteful. You fire it up and it spins at 3,600 RPMs in most cases, and it just doesn't stop. It burns fuel at a constant rate if it's running. Even if nothing is being powered, it's just burning through fuel. Uh, and of course that fuel usage goes up as soon as you add a load to it because it has to use more fuel to keep that engine running at 3,600 RPMs. Now, what if you were to pair something like this with a battery? It doesn't need to be a large battery. It just needs to be big enough to output whatever the load of the generator is. So let's say it's a one and a half kilowatt hour battery, similar to what you would find in a car. You'd be able to turn on that generator. It would have an automatic starter for the, the engine. And then that engine could charge up the battery if need be. And anything, any devices you're running would be able to run off the battery portion of it on a clean inverter. And the engine, all it would do is charge that battery. So this would provide clean power for all of your electronics. It would provide a very high output source of energy. And what another advantage to that is that the engine would be able to turn off. So if you're not drawing any energy from it, the engine is off and you're not burning through so much fuel. So that would make this sector so much more efficient. And I know there are companies out there like EcoFlow that uh, they pair something called a smart generator with their battery systems, but the cost is quite high. If you're looking at here in Canada, I think it's about $4,000 for their Delta Pro system. And then another about $1,700 to $2,000 for the smart generator. So you're looking at about $6,000 to do what a one to $2,000 generator, gas generator could do. So I would love to see these all-in-one hybrid packages where you get the generator with the battery on it, say like a lithium iron phosphate, so that way it's a durable battery, and that would reduce a lot of fuel costs when it comes to this system. If you think about it, the F-150 Power Boost is already a perfect example of this. You can use your F-150 Power Boost as a backup generator for your home, and the same thing happens. The engine does not have to run all the time. If you plug something into that truck, the engine is only going to run uh, when it needs to charge a battery. So it has a small battery in it, but you'd be able to run your toaster oven, coffee maker, and then once the battery's too low, the engine fires up. So it's a perfect system. And I hope to see more of that stuff moving forward. So the future is exciting and there's lots of new technologies out there that we can use to move forward. We just need a new way of thinking so that we can apply these technologies in the future.
And I also believe that software and design are gonna play a huge role in that. Smart grids are gonna be a huge part of the future in order to distribute the power where it needs to go, uh, to charge electric cars when there is excess solar and things like that. We are gonna have a huge interconnected grid in the future and it's really exciting. I think these technologies are pretty cool. So that brings us to the end of this episode for this week. It was um, a little off topic from electric vehicles, but I hope you could see how it was tying it into some of the technologies that were out there. Like that Tesla manifold system for their heat pump is very similar to the type of manifold system I'd like to see in a ground source heat pump and ideas like that and even using your vehicle as a backup generator so that's how i wanted to tie it into these technologies i'm just expanding our thinking on how we're going to move forward because i know there's a lot of people out there who are very dead fast against evs i'm not sure why they are they're a great product they don't fit everyone's needs like i said before plug-in hybrids are out there hybrids are out there there's a lot of ways we can decarbonize our future and I just wanted to make this podcast to expand our thinking on that subject. You can decarbonize your life in many different ways and you don't have to buy a $60,000 electric vehicle to do it. There are so many options out there for you. So because of that, I really do want to uh, hear your comments. I know I say this in every video, every podcast, but when it comes to subjects like this, there's a lot of ideas that you guys could add to it. So I wanna hear from you. Um, but that's it for now. If you like this video or this podcast, uh, give us a like, maybe subscribe to the channel and thank you for watching and listening.